Hello and welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be taking a look at Nate Silver's 538 gubernatorial forecast for the 2022 midterms. So basically we'll be breaking down each of these states, even the safe states, we'll be going through all of them as well as comparing them to my own 2022 gubernatorial forecast from the month of June. So basically we're on the same page here. We're both predicting the same races at around the same time. So I kind of want to see where Nate Silver and I disagree and we'll talk about those disagreements as well as we'll also look at the polls as well and the national environment and kind of gauge whether or not these are fair or accurate ratings for some of these races. So we'll get straight into it. But before we do, please consider subscribing down below if you're new to the channel and liking this video if you enjoy it. It really helps out the channel and helps me reach a wider audience and make more videos like these. So anyway, let's start off with the state of Oregon. We're going to go west to east just like we do in our usual prediction videos. Nate Silver has Tina Kotek with a 63% chance of victory, the Democratic nominee. Christine Drazans at 37 and the popular vote margin for the state is 46.3 to 43.5. So right off the bat, these odds actually are probably something I would agree with. I think the Democrat Tina Kotek is still favored to win this race. I had this as a tilt D, so I had the margin is slightly closer. But nonetheless, a 37% chance for Christine Drazan this early on in the midterms is a good sign for her. It really just depends how much of the vote Betsy Johnson takes away from Tina Kotek and potentially Drazan as well, because she's probably going to take from both parties but I would reckon that she's going to take more votes from Tina Kotek than Christine Drazan. If we look at previous uh, Oregon gubernatorial races, they tend to be quite close. If we go back to 2018, for instance, Kate Brown only got a bare majority, 50.1% in the popular vote in the state over her Republican opponent during a red wave year. Again, Kate Brown was not a real popular governor. Even back in 2016, she won by a pretty narrow margin for a safe state. And as you'll see through these other races, Oregon tends to have very close gubernatorial races, but the best Republicans tend to get is about 47% in the state. Now, 2022 is expected to be a pretty good year for the Republicans still. You know, again, we had the Dobbs decision about over a week ago, but the ramifications of that haven't been reflected in the polls yet. We've had some post-Dobbs polls that essentially tell the same story as we've been telling throughout the midterm cycle. Republicans are up and they're up pretty considerably. And Nate Silver actually has a pretty surprising forecast in that he thinks the popular vote margin for the House races will be R plus 6, which is a really high number if you think about it. That is on par with the 2010 elections. And if that's the case, then uh, I would suggest this would kind of translate throughout his uh, gubernatorial model. And I think while some of the states sort of reflect that, others don't. Again, 2020 was a D plus five environment. And we saw states like Pennsylvania barely go to the Democrats. Joe Biden won Pennsylvania by 1.2. He won Michigan by less than three. He won Wisconsin by 0.6, Georgia by 0.2, and Arizona by 0.3. And that was in a D plus five environment. If we're switching over to an environment that is likely 11 points more Republican, a lot of these states realistically should be going Republican and should be doing it by considerable margins. Now, that's not necessarily how politics works. Obviously, there's nuances, there's candidate quality, there's certain state level issues. So it's not an exact science, but generally you would think the Republicans would have the advantage in a lot of these states uh, by a decent amount, given the popular vote margin that Nate Silver's predicting. So I wanted to get that out of the way because I think that's relevant to the rest of the video as we look at these governor's races. So overall, Oregon, I tend to agree with Nate Silver. I think he's giving Tina Kotek a pretty fair advantage. I mean, I have it as tilty. He has his lean. Not really a tremendous difference, though. We both still have the Democrats favored. But a 37% chance of victory, like I said earlier, is pretty high for a Republican, especially in a state like Oregon. Moving on over down to California, this is basically the same margin that Gavin Newsom won by back in 2018. It's also the same margin he won by in the recall. Uh, I tend to agree with this. I have it as safe blue. I don't even argue with the margin very much. I think uh, Gavin Newsom will do basically about the same, but we'll really see how uh, the race shapes up as we get closer. But so far, I agree with California's result. Moving on over to Idaho, Brad Little getting about 65% of the vote. Uh, I think that's pretty fair. Again, if we look at 2020, for instance, Donald Trump got 63% of the vote in the state of Idaho. And if we look at Brad Little's last election, he got about 59. This, of course, was during a blue wave year. So Brad Little's obviously going to do a lot better. He's a fairly popular governor, fairly generic Republican, basically. And I think he'll do quite well given that. So I'd agree with this categorization. 
Moving on down to Nevada, this is interesting. Joe Lombardo is at a 42% chance to win incumbent Democratic Governor Steve Sisolak at 58. Uh, the margin they have is really interesting because they have 6.5 as undecideds or independents, which I think is a little high to say the least. Uh, but they have Sisolak only getting 47.5% of the vote. And I actually tend to agree with that. His vote share might be that uh, small, but I think Joe Lombardo will do a lot better. Now, I have this race as lean Republican. I think Joe Lombardo will probably win by about two points. Uh, but again, a 42% uh, chance of victory is almost half. So really, Nate Silver is not exactly that confident in this prediction. And given how narrow the uh, vote share projection is, uh, it kind of reflects that. But ultimately, I would disagree with Nate Silver. I think Joe Lombardo is the slight favorite given the national environment and given the way Nevada has been trending. If we take a look at the Nevada polls real quick, so far Steve Sisolak is in the lead, but he only has a 2.1% lead. And, you know, again, we're in a red wave year. Republicans are likely to be slightly undersampled. They have the momentum factor. We've seen this in other states with Democratic incumbents in red wave years in the past. We saw it in Virginia back in 2014 when Mark Warner was up by about 10 points and then Ed Gillespie ended up losing by about one. So I'm not saying you're going to see something nearly as dramatic like this in Nevada, but the fact that an incumbent Democrat is only pulling ahead by two points isn't really a good sign. And the latest poll out of Nevada, Joe Lombardo has a slight lead. So I do think Joe Lombardo is the favorite in Nevada. I'd put his chances of winning at about 60-40. But still, Steve Sisolak still could uh, eke it out. Moving on over to the state of Wyoming, this is pretty straightforward. Mark Gordon, the incumbent Republican governor, is probably going to win by a pretty colossal amount. 69% I think is pretty fair, I guess. That's usually about the amount that Republicans get in the state of Wyoming. Trump almost got 70, so I wouldn't even be surprised if he gets about 72-73% of the vote uh, in Wyoming. But overall, pretty solid. Nothing uh, of real disagreement there. Uh, moving on down to the state of Arizona. Now, this one is going to be really interesting. I have Arizona as lean Republican. Uh, Nate Silver actually has Kerry Lake winning the uh, state of Arizona by about 0.9%. So overall, me and Nate Silver agree on the outcome. I just think Kerry Lake will win by a slightly larger margin than him. But nonetheless, no real disagreement here. I think Kerry Lake is the favorite since it is going to be a Republican wave year. But again, Katie Hobbs still within striking distance, still could hypothetically win this race if the tide does turn. Moving on over to the state of Colorado. Now, this is a state I have a decent amount of disagreement with, not because of the outcome, but because of the margin mainly. So I have Colorado rated as likely Democrat. And I think that's a pretty fair categorization, given the fact that Colorado, while it is a safe state on the national level, I think in uh, more statewide races and local races in these off-year elections. It's more of a likely to lean Democratic state. I think Jared Polis will ultimately end up winning by about six to eight points given the national environment. I think it's going to hurt him, but he's certainly in a good position to win re-election. And I don't think the Republicans have a realistic chance of winning the Colorado governorship as of right now. So having Heidi Ganahl at about 5% chance of winning, I think is pretty accurate. However, I don't think she's only going to get 39% of the vote. I think it's extremely unlikely that she does even worse than Donald Trump in this state. I could see Heidi Ganahl maybe getting about 43, 44% of the vote, but 39% I think is much too small. And I could see Jared Polis probably pulling off maybe 53, potentially 54% of the vote as well. So maybe an, a 10 point margin, uh, give or take somewhere in Colorado. Moving on down to New Mexico. This is another area where I disagree with Nate Silver. He has Michelle Lujan Grisham at a 78% chance to win, Mark Ronchetti at just 22. So the odds I tend to disagree with, I think Mark Ronchetti definitely has a much higher chance to win this governor's race. He's outperformed the polls before. I think it's very unlikely that he does worse in this race than he did back in his Senate race in 2020, which again, he overperformed Trump by about four to five points. Donald Trump lost the state of New Mexico by 10.8% back in 2020, while Mark Ronchetti only lost the state of New Mexico by 6.1. So he overperformed Trump by about four points or so. And I think the fact that He's that electable, again, in a year that wasn't favorable to Republicans nationwide, especially in New Mexico. I think he has the advantage given the national environment and given the fact that Michelle Lujan Grisham is one of the most unpopular incumbent governors around the country. So this margin, I tend to disagree with a lot. I think Mark Ronchetti will probably eke it out in sort of a 50 to 48 or 48.5 margin 
in New Mexico. Potentially, it could get closer, maybe like 49, 47, just because New Mexico has a decent amount of third party voters. But ultimately, I definitely disagree with this rating. Moving on up to the state of South Dakota, Christy Nome, not really going to see any real competition. Uh, a 68 to 31 margin is probably what I'd expect in South Dakota in an off-year election. Christy Nome last time, though, interestingly enough, back in 2018, struggled to win this governor's race against Billy Sutton, who was a conservative blue dog Democrat, very electable in the state of South Dakota, and ultimately almost won this governorship, which would have been very interesting to see South Dakota blue on a governor's map. But ultimately, Christy Nome is in a much stronger position now. Her opponent, I think, is just a generic Democrat, not really a blue dog or anything. She's a national figure, well-established, so this rating, I think, is pretty solid. Moving on down to Nebraska, same thing. Jim Pillen's probably going to win uh, with 61% of the vote. I could see that. Maybe the Democrat getting about 37%. Uh, Democrats, for whatever weird reason, seem to be a bit more energized in the state of Nebraska, at least according to that special election. Uh, but I don't think it's going to be remotely competitive. So this rating, I, I would agree with. Moving on down to Kansas, slight disagreement here with Nate Silver. I have the state of Kansas as likely Republican, so I guess you could say that's a bigger disagreement with Nate Silver. Uh, we both agree on who will win. Derek Schmidt is the likely next governor of Kansas. However, I disagree with this margin quite a bit. I think Laura Kelly at the end of the day is going to lose by a much larger margin than people expect. I see her getting maybe 44, 45% of the vote to Derek Schmidt's 53, 54% uh, of the vote. So ultimately, we agree on the outcome, but I massively disagree with the margin. A state like Alabama, for instance, another safe red state, when they elected a Democrat uh, really in a fluke election, they rejected said Democrat by a colossal amount. Laura Kelly, though, is popular and that will help her. But ultimately, I don't think it's going to do her any favors in such a hostile midterm environment. Maybe if 2022 was also a blue wave year, I think she would win re-election. But as of right now, I think the odds are heavily against her. And while I agree with Nate Silver's outcome, I don't agree with the uh, margin here. Moving on down to Oklahoma. This is really interesting. Nate Silver has 8% going to independents and undecideds. I don't know really where that comes from. Maybe the polling. Uh, Kevin Stitt, I think, will do a lot better than this. He's at 58%. Uh, he's a fairly popular governor. Uh, he didn't do so great back in 2018 compared to other Republicans. He only won the state of Oklahoma by about 12 points. But keep in mind, he was running off the back of a very unpopular Republican governor, Mary Phelan, I think her name was. So this isn't too surprising, especially given the fact that it was also a red wave year. Nonetheless, despite uh, these margins that the Democrats were getting in Democrat areas like Oklahoma, even almost winning Tulsa County, uh, the Republicans still win by 12. So that goes to show you how red the state of Oklahoma is. I disagree with the margin, but obviously the characterization. I think Kevin Stitt will probably get, you know, 64, 65, uh, potentially even 68% of the vote. I think he'll outrun Trump. I mean, Trump even got uh, a higher percentage of the vote back in 2018 than Kevin Stitt did, uh, or is projected to, according to 538. So I definitely disagree with that. Again, maybe statewide races in Oklahoma are closer, but I think it would probably be in the mid 60s somewhere, not in the uh, not in the high 50s. Moving on down to Texas, this is interesting because uh, 538 has better or work getting a lower share of the vote than even I do. I think better or work will probably get about 42% of the vote. I think Greg Abbott probably still gets about 55. So he does very similar to how he did back in 2018. Greg Abbott is still popular in the state of Texas, but he's not as popular as he was back in 2018. Texas is a bluer state as a result. More voters are registered, uh, more Democrats on the voter rolls. So I think that's going to help better work. But ultimately, I think he still loses by a safe margin. I think this race, uh, honestly, in the last election, better work was underrated because he had the national environment uh, working with him. So obviously the polling was against him, but the national environment was with him. So ultimately, better work overperformed his polls against Ted Cruz in the Senate race. Uh, I don't think you're going to see the same thing in Texas in the governorship. I think right now Greg Abbott's being underestimated, and I think he's likely to end up getting 55, even 56% of the vote in Texas. So we both agree, safe red state, not too much else to go on uh, in there. Moving on up to the state of Minnesota, Tim Walls uh, winning is something I have. I have him winning by a lean margin. I think he'll win by about four to five points. Uh, agree with Nate Silver here, disagree with the margin. Nate Silver has Tim Walls at 51.2, but for some reason the Republican only at 42.6. So I agree with Tim Walls' margin. I just think the Republican's probably going to get about 46, maybe even 47% of the vote 
Uh, but ultimately, not too much disagreement on the outcome there. Moving on down to Iowa, total agreement here. Kim Reynolds winning by a landslide. It's basically what I had. About 58% of the vote seems about right. She'll probably run a little bit behind uh, Chuck Grassley, but ultimately I think both of them are going to get in the high 50s, maybe even low 60s. I think maybe low 60s is possible for Chuck Grassley, but I think Kim Reynolds will probably get in the high 50s, so uh, agree there. Moving on down to Arkansas. Uh, yeah, basically agree with this. Sarah Huckabee Sanders is going to win no matter what. It's a safe Republican state. The Huckabee name is a household name in Arkansas politics. Given the fact that Asa Hutchinson was able to win by similar margins, again, he was, he's a popular governor in Arkansas, but I think Sarah Huckabee Sanders, just based on how red Arkansas is alone, will probably run pretty similar to Trump, maybe even ahead of a Trump in 2022. So agree in Arkansas. Moving on down to the state, moving on up rather, to the state of Wisconsin. Uh, some disagreement here. I think uh, 538 is overestimating Tony Evers here. They have him at a 64% chance of victory. Uh, I think that's quite unlikely because I think Tony Evers is one of the more endangered uh, gubernatorial incumbents. Uh, they have Cleefish as the nominee. Tim Michaels was the Trump-endorsed candidate, and the primary is not until August, so that very well could change. Uh, but ultimately, if we take a look at the polls for the uh, Wisconsin governorship, uh, Evers is ahead. And in some of the polls, he's ahead by a crazy amount, which I think is a little ridiculous. Uh, but ultimately against Cleefish, he's up uh, by a decent amount. But these are with registered voters. So I would throw these in the garbage right off the bat because I don't think registered voters is a really accurate way to portray this race. This midterm especially is going to be mostly driven based on turnout, not going to be driven on, you know, how many registered Dems or Republicans are in a given state. So I disagree with this. Also, Tim Michaels, uh, who's actually polling worse, interestingly enough, I think is likely to be the nominee, but I think whoever the Republican is, is still going to end up winning and beating Evers by about two to three. Again, in 2018, uh, he only won by a point despite the national environment. And I know Wisconsin likes their incumbents, but still, I think I would have expected a better result out of a Democrat in Wisconsin, maybe winning by about two to three at least against Scott Walker. So ultimately, I think given the fact that he barely won in 2018, the fact that Wisconsin is essentially gridlocked given the fact that Republicans control the state legislature. Tony Evers controls the governor's mansion. There's really not a whole lot getting done. It's basically just the status quo is remaining. I think voters will be dissatisfied with that and probably change leadership in the state of Wisconsin. Moving on down to Illinois, uh, I think Bailey could do a bit better than this. I think J.B. Pritzker is going to win and he's probably going to, I had it as a likely margin. I think he wins by about 10 or 11 just under what I categorize as a safe margin. So uh, Nate Silver is giving J.B. Pritzker a little bit more of an edge, and that potentially could be the case. We'll see. It really depends on how high Republican turnout is in Illinois and how well they do in these other down-ballot races, like the House races, for instance. But so far, not a huge amount of disagreement. I just think Bailey will do a little bit better. I think Pritzker will do a little bit worse, just given the red year environment. But ultimately, I still think uh, there's no way the Republican wins this race. Moving on down to Tennessee, Bill Lee at 59%, the Democrat at 29, basically 30, and then for some reason, independents and undecideds at 10. Uh, I think that's a little bit ridiculous. I don't know why Nate Silver is giving the independents such a high amount. I don't really think there's a huge independent ticket in the state of Tennessee, unless I'm wrong, but I guess, see, there is a lot of independents, but I really think at the end of the day, they eat up at most three or 4% of the vote. So I don't think they're going to eat up 10% of the vote. I think that's a little ridiculous. So I think Bill Lee could probably get maybe 62% of the vote. The Democrat may be running at about, you know, 35% or something like that. And then the independents eating up the rest. Moving on down to Alabama, Kay Ivey getting about 64% of the vote. That's probably exactly what I would expect. I have this also, again, is safe. So no real surprise there. Moving on up to Michigan. This is an area where I have a decent amount of disagreement with Nate Silver. Not necessarily on the winner as of right now, but on the margin. I think Gretchen Whitmer, as of this point, is still favored to win the Michigan governor's election, but I think she's only going to win by a margin of two points or less. I think the red wave environment is going to make this race very close, but ultimately I could see her winning by about 1.5, a little bit under two percentage points. I mean, again, 
Michigan was a state that only went to Joe Biden by about three. Not every state votes in line with the national popular vote, obviously, but this was a D plus environment and we're going into a D plus, uh, an R plus six environment. A huge shift in the kind of electorate we're seeing. So I think Gretchen Whitmer is going to have a much tougher time getting reelected. Again, last time in 2018, she won by a pretty sizable margin. She beat her opponent by about nine percentage points, almost 10. This time around, I still think she has the advantage based on the disarray of the Michigan Republican Party and the fact that most of the candidates don't seem to be particularly strong. Uh, so very much disagree with the margin here, but I definitely uh, agree with the outcome as of right now. Moving on down to Ohio, I pretty much agree with this. Mike DeWine's going to win in a landslide. Ohio tends to reelect their Republican governors in landslides, so not really a huge surprise there. Um, no real contention with that rating. Moving on up to the state of Maine, Janet Mills against Paula Page. Paula Page at 46.3. Uh, I don't see this as likely D. Uh, I put it as tilt Republican, but I could see it really going either way, honestly. I could even see it as a three-point margin for Mills, but I think Janet Mills is being a little bit overestimated here. Uh, you know, it, like I said, if Nate Silver had this within three points or something like that, I wouldn't really have a whole lot of disagreement. But in my prediction, I had Paul LePage eking it out because interestingly enough, the ranked choice voting system in Maine does not apply to governor's races, which means I think Paul LePage has a slight edge because there's gonna be a number of third-party candidates on the ballot, most likely it's Maine, there's a decent amount. And people are going to vote for third party candidates, maybe by a margin of three or four percentage points. I think that hurts Janet Mills at the end of the day, helps Paul LePage. I think he narrowly ekes it out, uh, but a minor disagreement, I guess you could say here. New Hampshire and Vermont, not really a whole lot to talk about. New Hampshire is safe Republican. It was safe Republican back in 2020. Chris Sununu outran uh, Joe Biden by a colossal amount. He outran every uh, person on the ballot in New Hampshire and he ended up winning with 65% of the vote. Incredibly popular governor. Uh, Sununu is somebody who ended up moving a decent amount to the left since he took office. He was even tepidly pro-Trump at some point. I don't know if that still holds, but on a number of issues, he's been a lot more centrist or even left wing on. So ultimately, that's why he's so popular in a state like New Hampshire, despite New Hampshire being generally a blue state. So agree there, agree with the margin, all that looks pretty good from Nate Silver. Vermont is interesting. They actually have the Democrat at a 5% chance of winning. I don't know why that would be the case. Uh, maybe because they think that Republicans would vote for independence, maybe by a couple of points. I don't really know. Uh, but ultimately, I agree. I think Phil Scott uh, is in a strong position. I think he wins by more. I think he could win by about 66 to even 70% uh, of the vote, uh, depending on who his opponent is. Moving on over down to the state of Massachusetts. Uh, agreement here. I think this is about what I'd expect out of Massachusetts. Charlie Baker could have run for re-election, and you know, some people thought he was going to run for re-election. But ultimately, he kind of determined that he might lose a primary, and in the polling, it sort of indicated that he was on track to lose a Republican primary. He didn't want to run as an independent or a Democrat, so he ultimately ended up not running for a third term and basically giving the Democrats a safe seat for the governorship. So they're not really going to have to spend any money on the state of Massachusetts. Whereas if Charlie Baker was running, they may have tried to contest the race. Although at the same time, he was probably a shoo-in as well. So in agreement with Nate Silver's numbers there. Moving on down to Connecticut. Uh, I currently have the state of Connecticut as lean Democrat. I think Ned Lamont might be helped by the fact that he's much more popular now than uh, Malloy was back in 2018 when that sort of was a huge drag on Lamont. So sort of he was being dragged down by Dan Malloy's incredible unpopularity. He was one of the most unpopular governors in the entire country. Fortunately for the Democrats, Dan Malloy couldn't run for a third term. Otherwise, this seat could have been put in a serious amount of jeopardy, considering the fact that despite a blue wave environment, Bob Stefanowski came really close to winning this race. But ultimately, I think he probably loses as of right now by about three to four points. I think the national environment will help him, but ultimately I think Lamont might eke it out just based on his popularity alone. Moving on over to Rhode Island. Uh, I, I agree with this, I, I guess, you know, uh, Rhode Island has slightly been trending more to the right. Dan McKee is not really a popular governor. In fact, he's being primaried uh, by a number of Democrats and we'll see how well he does in his primary, which I think is all the way in, September, so it's going to be a little while, but he's not exactly a strong incumbent and not exactly a popular governor either. So I wouldn't be surprised if the Republican can crack 40 here 
in a red wave again rhode island has been trending to the right at least on the presidential level i mean if we go back donald trump was able to get 38.6 percent of the vote in rhode island this was a state that republicans were struggling to crack 35 percent back in 2008 and 2012 so uh, ultimately in agreement there with that rating not really much to talk about uh, perhaps I'll do a separate video on this race because it could get somewhat interesting uh, but nonetheless it, it really does depend on the Republican nominee and all that as to how close uh, we get here moving on down to Pennsylvania this is going to be an interesting one now this is a uh, state that I definitely disagree with again with Nate Silver I think Doug Mastriano has a slight advantage given the national environment and given how close he is in the polls. Now, I was one of the people saying that I didn't think Mastriano was that electable. And as of right now, I'm being proven wrong, considering he is polling better than Oz in every single instance. If we go down to the general election polls, and we've only got three. And again, these polls so early out aren't necessarily as accurate. So in some cases, they might be underestimating Shapiro, underestimating Mastriano. But nonetheless, uh, you know, Mastriano polls around 45, 46% on average. You know, Shapiro is at about 49, 48. So uh, I think Mastriano is definitely in the advantage right now. I think he wins narrowly. I think he wins by less than two. I think his controversies will come up throughout the campaign, but I think Josh Shapiro needs to run on other issues besides the fact that Mastriano is, you know, seen as a radical or something like that, because I don't think that's necessarily going to deter. If anything, I think that's going to increase Republican turnout and kind of have a backfire effect in the state of Pennsylvania. So ultimately, I think Mastriano has a slight advantage here. I would put it at about uh, 55 Mastriano, 45 Shapiro, because Shapiro has proven that he is a very electable candidate. When Shapiro won back in 2016, he outran Hillary Clinton by a pretty considerable amount. He got 51% of the vote in the state. I think now that he's running for a higher office, though, he's going to be a much more high profile candidate. So more people might be, you know, some of those Republicans and independents that may have voted for him down ballot because they are just, you know, more of those legacy old fashioned Democrats might decide to vote for Mastriano or not vote for him at all. So I think the electability argument for Shapiro is somewhat valid, although I think in a red wave year, it's a lot less so. And given the fact that Tom Wolf is not that popular anymore, and the fact that Pennsylvania is one of those purple states, I don't think Shapiro has the advantage as of right now. We'll see where the polling leads. Obviously this could change, but as of right now, I think Mastriano is the favorite here in Pennsylvania. Moving on down to Maryland. Now this is a state that, uh, depending on the Republican nominee, could either be a safe Democratic state or a likely to even lean Democratic state. Peter Franchot, the comp troller for the state of Maryland, I think, is pretty popular. He outruns basically every other Democrat on the ballot. He's going up against a likely Republican nominee, Kelly Schultz, although there was actually a poll, I think, that had Dan Cox leading. So Dan Cox could also be the nominee. Now, the difference between these two candidates, and I'll talk about it more in another video, is that Kelly Schultz is really the Larry Hogan type Republican uh, pretty moderate, can win in a blue state. Dan Cox is very much an Amanda Chase-style Republican. Super, super MAGA, super pro-Trump. Again, in a state that Donald Trump lost by 33 percentage points. So obviously, if Dan Cox is the nominee, I think this is going to be safe for the Democrats. If Kelly Schultz is the nominee, I think you could see Democrats still with an advantage, but I think it's going to be a much closer race, and I think Democrats are actually going to have to spend money to keep this seat blue. But ultimately, I just disagree a bit on the margin. I think Kelly Schultz could easily get 44% of the vote, maybe even 45% of the vote in Maryland, given the fact that she does have Hogan's backing. I think she's going to run up strong margins in places like Anne Arundel County, Frederick County, obviously the red counties as well. So uh, disagree with the margin, but the outcome I think is pretty fair. So moving on down to the state of South Carolina, this prediction from Nate Silver, I would tend to agree with, you know, him getting uh, Henry McMaster getting 58% of the vote. I think Joe Cunningham might even crack 40. I think uh, South Carolina is a state that's not necessarily that elastic. You know, it's very rare to see Democrats get under 40% uh, of the vote, but this will be a red wave year and Tim Scott's made it happen multiple times. So not exactly too surprising. However, I think the Democrat will do a little bit better. Joe Cunningham is a decent candidate but again he's running in a safe red state so ultimately i don't think cunningham is really viable though in this sort of national environment moving on down to georgia this is a state i would definitely agree with nate silver on um i, I think it might even be a tad bit closer but the polls for brian kemp have been pretty exceptional um he's led in every single poll or tied 
in every poll in Georgia. And ultimately, if you take a look at the state as a whole, uh, Brian Kemp is much more favored in a state than somebody like Herschel Walker. He's outrunning Walker by about several points. And whether that happens at the end of the day remains to be seen. It seems like Georgia's not really a split ticket state. You know, obviously when Warnock won, Ossoff also won. So, you know, a lot of things like that. It really isn't a split ticket state. Although you could argue that in the uh, Senate race back in 2020, before it went to a runoff, David Perdue outran Trump pretty considerably. So it's not out of the realm of possibility that Brian Kemp uh, outruns Herschel Walker by a decent amount. Also, he's an incumbent and he's a fairly popular governor too. So I think this margin is pretty accurate and pretty lined up with the one that I have as well. I have Brian Kemp winning by about five or six points. It's basically about the same here. Finally, moving on down to Florida, I would definitely be in agreement here. I think Ron DeSantis has a huge chance of winning and I think he's going to win by about 10 or more points. I don't know if he's going to get over 12 though. They technically have this as basically a safe race for Ron DeSantis. I think he ends up winning by 10, but ultimately in agreement with Nate Silver in that race as well. Almost forgot the two states, Alaska and Hawaii, because we usually don't talk about them, but I almost completely skipped over these states and I don't want to. Alaska has a pretty interesting uh, prediction to say the least. Lean Republican uh, Alaska really needs to just fix their electoral system. I don't know why they have five people in sort of a big jungle primary for the general election. I think that's a really dumb system. Uh, I don't like it. It's very confusing. But ultimately, this is the result they sort of have. I guess Nate Silver knows something I don't. But again, I've had a decent amount of disagreement with some of his uh, projections, but I'm not really sure about the Alaska governor's race. I'll have to make a separate video on that in the future. And moving on to Hawaii, pretty much agree here. The Democrats going to win by a safe margin. So ultimately, that's it for the 2022 538 governor's predictions. Again, I'll make another video with the Senate as well as the House predictions, kind of comparing my numbers to Nate Silver's, and we'll see how accurate both of us are at the end of the midterms in November. So anyway, thank you all for watching this video. Please leave a thumbs up if you enjoyed. Subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell notification so you don't miss any more videos I put out. And as always, again, thank you all for watching, and I hope to see you in the next one.